Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Mortgage Heroes Weekly Podcast, and this is Andy Cruz in Business Development. This week, we have to talk all about the Federal Reserve's most recent rate hike of a quarter percent and the press conference. They had some prepared issued statements that Jerome Powell gave as well, but the press conference at the end was really the doozy. So um, we're going to talk a little bit first about the bullet points of his prepared statements and kind of set the framework for the conversation we have to have today. Some of the things that were discussed and decided will have a material impact in mortgage and real estate kind of through 2023, uh, but also into 2024 and 2025. I'll get into a little bit of why that is, but it's really important that we kind of build the base case for what's happening first. We're going to show you a couple of charts here for those of you that are watching that are going to show what some of their projections are based on what some of the current data is showing them and kind of why they had to come to some of the conclusions that they had to come to this week. So real quick, I'm going to roll through some bullet points of his prepared statements rather than listen to the entire nine minutes. And then we're actually going to do some commentary about the uh, press conference Q&A that he got from the reporters in the room because there were some very interesting questions, some great questions, but also some very curious answers as Jerome tried to very delicately answer the questions appropriately for the context and the scale of the stage he was on, uh, but also uh, to try to give some confidence and hope into the markets that are really looking for some stable footing right now in all aspects of money and markets. So, so let's jump into these bullet points really quick. So uh, one of his uh, main comments was that the housing sector remains weak and that they, they expect subdued growth with real GDP being only 0.4% this year. And then the actual projection for GDP through 2023 and 2024 and 2025 is, is still all between 0.4% and 2%. Now that's for the next two and a half years. They're saying that we're gonna expect GDP to be uh, 0.4% and maybe up back to 2%, but no higher than that. Some of the, one of the interesting things that he mentioned later on was that they're going to uh, expect a little bit slower than normal growth. So I think that's a reference to this, uh, but you know, that's partly because of the next thing he said, he said, which was unemployment. Uh, I talked about unemployment being 3.6%. Uh, I talked about the labor market still being really tight, uh, but labor demand still exceeds the supply of workers and their unemployment expectations need to rise to four and a half percent. And unfortunately, what that means is that more people need to be unemployed, but by the millions. And here's what that really quickly means translating in the math. If we have 3.6% uh, in uh, unemployment right now, and our labor force is approximately 160 million, it's actually, I think, a little bit more than that, according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. Uh, if we have a about a 1% increase in unemployment, that's roughly 1.6 million jobs that, that have to be cut. And those people enter the employment unemployment line between now and the end of 2023, over the next nine months. That is a, a heavy cutting that's to come. So uh, he also said that they are expecting unemployment to be 4.6% at the end of next year, which means that unemployment will uh, be expected to, and projected to continue into 2024 and through 2024. So if you're counting by the months, that would be 21 months of unemployment getting to 4.5% and then being at 4.6% by the end of next year. Uh, he also cited that at, as of January 2023, the year-over-year -year PCE number, the personal consumption expenditure, this is a measurement of inflation. We've been talking about a Monday Mortgage Minute and other shows. Uh, it's at 5.4%. This is well above their 2% target. And that excludes food and energy. That excludes the food and energy, which by the way, we all still happen to be paying for, don't we? <laughs> so uh, that, that's a really high number, even if you extract the extremely volatile and high cost of food right now, and energy categories. Energy includes not just the gas in your car, but it includes also you know gas and electricity, which if you're here in San Diego, uh, you, you're feeling the pain in those things uh, most recently as well. Uh, then he cited that their core PCE still was at 4.7%. Now, again, even if they're trying to get to a 2% target in that, 4.7% is still extremely high. Uh, and there's gonna, it's going to take a lot of downward pressure to move that back down to the two, to the two zone. Now, ending February of 2023, the CPI was at 6% and the core was CPI was at 5.5%. So again, returning inflation to 2% has a long way to go. And he even said this, it is likely to be bumpy. Now, remember the people have been asking these soft landing questions. You're going to hear this come up in the press conference. Oh, is there going to be a soft landing? Is there a soft landing? And his uh, comment in his prepared statements was that it's going to be bumpy. 
Uh, the Fed monetary policy actions are guided by the mandate for maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. So that's kind of like their core charge, like their mission statement is to do those things. But that's coming under heavy threat right now because inflation's running rampant. They have to cause unemployment in order to get prices back. So you kind of have to like throw the baby out with the bathwater, even though that, that even though that saying is don't do that. They kind of have to do that in this case in order to achieve their goal. So they did raise rates a quarter percent, which brought their target range to 4.75 to 5%. And uh, recent events in the banking sector uh, will result in tighter credit conditions for households and businesses. That's a key point. And businesses. That's part of the domino effect that's going to cause some unemployment and uh, some little uh, hardship, I think, on some businesses. Uh, but he also mentioned it's too soon to measure those effects and therefore too soon to determine how the monetary uh, policy should respond moving forward because they're just going to continue taking in data every single month while they monitor the situation. Uh, and then I will quote this from him. We no longer state that we anticipate ongoing rate increases will be appropriate to quell inflation. Some additional policy firming will be appropriate. So was that him signaling there's no more hikes, but they have some other action that he's not alluding to and that he doesn't make reference to. And this kind of came back around in another question in the press conference we're going to listen to. Uh, and there really wasn't a solid answer, as you'll see. And I think it's because he doesn't want to reveal what it is they might have to do. But he did make a very telling comment about the consequence if they don't. And that was a little bit startling. OK, so the target for the Fed funds rate uh, by the end of 2023 is 5.1%. And here's why that matters, is I just mentioned to you that the current range is 4.75 to 5. And if they're saying that the Fed funds rate could be 5.1 by the end of the year, well, that means we'll have to be in a range of 5 to 5 and a quarter, which does suggest that maybe at some point during the rest of the year, there could be another quarter percent rate hike. Uh, that did come up uh, and he didn't really answer it, but we'll talk about that. They are projecting that the Fed funds rate will be 4.3% by the end of 2024 and 3.1% by the end of 2025. He said they'll make decisions meeting by meeting based on the totality of the data that they have incoming and that returning inflation to 2% will require below trend growth and softening in labor conditions. Again, code for negative GDP or recession and more unemployment. So what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, pivot into listening, listening to some of the uh, commentary and also some of the questions and answer period from the press briefing room here with the Fed. And we're going to stop a couple times here and we're going to react and respond to some of these things. But uh, let's go ahead and jump right into the first question. Thank you, uh, Colby Smith with the Financial Times. Um, how confident is the committee uh, that the recent stress that we've seen and you've alluded to is contained at this point? and that deposit flight among mid-sized lenders in particular um, has ceased. Thanks. So I, I guess our view is that the, the banking system is sound and it's resilient. It's got strong capital and liquidity. We took powerful actions with Treasury and the FDIC, which demonstrate that all depositors' savings are safe and that the banking system is safe. Deposit flows in the banking system have stabilized over the last week. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that we've undertaken, we're undertaking a thorough internal review that will identify where we can strengthen supervision and regulation. So really quickly, that was real interesting because he, you know, he's, he's obviously admitting the thing that they already did, which was that they came together and they kind of backstopped the SVB, uh, the SVB situation. Uh, but what's really interesting is that, you know, they're gonna have to like go and figure out what happened when some of what the, the cause was, re, re, was related to the fact that SVB Bank was holding so many U.S. treasuries, which have an inverse correlation to the Fed funds rate. So basically, in short, what that means is when the Fed funds rate gets increased, from 0%, remember, from 0% March 2022 to now 4.75, one year later, that significantly depreciates the value of those U.S. Treasuries that SVB Bank was holding for long term, which means to maturity down the line, years down the line. So it immediately devalues those, and that caused them to have to uh, basically offload as much as they could as quickly as possible to recapture cash to close the gap because they were going upside down on those holdings really quickly. Follow up. I mean, given all of the stress and the uncertainty that you've also alluded to in the statement, how seriously was a was a pause considered uh, for this meeting? So we considered, um, we did consider that in, in the days running up to the meeting, uh, and you see the decision that we made, which, which uh, I'll say a couple things about. First, it was supported by a very strong consensus, and I'll be happy to explain why. And really, it is that the the intermeeting data on inflation and the labor. Real quick, he's looking at his notes a lot, which means he probably was expecting this question and they had a prepared semi-canned answer to this. But 
uh, yeah, they, they really had to, they had to do this. And, and we've been talking about this a while is that, you know, if they were to uh, suspend rate hikes at this meeting, it would give the indication and it would, the interpretation would be that, oh shoot, this whole banking situation might actually be worse than they're letting us know. And that's why they have to pause. And then also pausing could be misunderstood as maybe quantitative easing or allowing the markets to have more liquidity come to them, which is the opposite of trying to fight inflation, restore price stability and create uh, easing or softening in the labor market. So they got stuck between a rock and a hard place here, but listen to what he has to say about this. The intermeeting data on inflation and the labor market came in stronger than expected. And really before the recent events, we were clearly on track to continue with ongoing rate hikes. In fact, as of a couple of weeks ago, it, it looked like we'd need to raise rates over the course of the year more than we'd expected. To. Okay, don't let that go by you really quick. So remember a while ago, he was talking about the terminal rate and he was saying that our terminal rate will have to be higher and we'll have to stay there for longer. He said this like at the last meeting or two meetings ago. And and the point here is he's saying, yeah, we were talking about it going through 2023, which is basically admitting they were going to do maybe another quarter or another half or maybe three more quarter increases throughout the rest of the year. But now they have to reassess that based on the situation here. We are committed to restoring price stability and all of the evidence says that the public has confidence that we will do so, that we'll bring in inflation down to 2% over time. It is important that we sustain that confidence with our actions as well as our words. So we also assess. Uh, real quickly, before we go on, I want to uh, put on the screen here, you're going to see that you see the PCE inflation chart that they're putting up here and their projection is that 2%. So he's saying that the, the, the public has confidence that we'll bring inflation back down to 2% over time. Um, but, but here's the thing. If you look at the chart on the screen right now, you're going to see that the inflation target of 2% is not met until 2025. So that means that, you know, March of 2023, we have a good, what, at least year and a half to two and a half years before we get inflation back to 2%. And then you couple that with his previous statements about what they need unemployment to be by 2023 and through 2024. That means that the crushing of em employment is going to be the catalyst that's going to help drive down prices because there will be less money chasing goods in the market. Uh, Chair Powell, uh, Howard Schneider from Reuters. So um, I, I want to go back to your February press conference. You mentioned the word disinflation, I believe, uh, nine or 10 times, a process that w you felt was... Uh, 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 I forget the word you use, but gratefully underway or something like that. Is disinflation still occurring in the U.S. today? Yes. <laughs> I mean, Great question. What actually, what actually happened, Howard, was I got the question 12 times. So it's a, <laughs> maybe it's a feature, not a bug. But, uh, so, but yeah, I, I, absolutely, the pro, the, the, absolutely the same. The story is, is intact. So it's really three parts, right? W goods inflation has been coming down now for six months. It's proceeding more slowly than we would have liked, but it's certainly proceeding. Um, housing services is, is really a matter of time passing. We continue to see the new leases being signed at much lower levels of inflation. So that's 44 percent of the, of the core PCE index where you've got a story that's ongoing. Where we didn't have in February and we still don't have now is a sign of progress in the non-housing uh, services sector. And that is um, it, you know, that's just something that will have to come through. through. All right. So this is an important part of the press conference, actually, where uh, he was talking about goods uh, has definitely come down. Housing has definitely come down. And we see that in mortgage and real estate. Um, those of you who may not be in the industry, but you're listening or watching to the show, um, mortgage rate applications, there was a chart that came out a couple days ago that mortgage uh, applications by volume are the lowest they've been since 1995. Now, that's just an indication to the appetite in the market for people to buy a new home or refinance their home. Uh, but here's the other part of that is that even though the housing sector as at large has uh, come under heavy duress with a lot of these policy changes and their ripple effects through the market, there's still people buying homes. There's still people refinancing because of their situation, their circumstance. So in, in a certain regard, uh, whatever your situation is, doesn't doesn't matter what they're doing over here with the Fed, because whatever your situation is, is paramount to whatever choices they have to make. Again, it may not be favorable as far as like what's the best case scenario, all things considered good, but in some times of of life, there's situations where uh, what you need to do is what you need to do because it needs to be done, not whether or not it's favorable for you on the financial aspect in the short term. Long term is always correctable. Uh, but the non-housing sector is what we really need to look at because the non-housing sector still shows a little bit of strength. And he's kind of saying in a veiled way, they need that to get worse before they can see the advancement of the agenda items and the, and the things they're trying to accomplish. Through softening demand and perhaps some softening in labor market conditions. We don't see that yet. And that's, that's of course, 56% of the index. So the story is pretty much the same. I will say that the inflation data that we got, to your point, 
really pointed to stronger inflation. Stronger inflation. Like he said, stronger inflation still. It's going to take time. This is going to take time to work its way through the system and get ourselves out of this. Curious uh, how you view financial conditions now and if yeah, credit okay. were to tighten enough, if that would prompt a rate cut. So um, financial conditions seem to have tightened and probably by more than the traditional indexes say because the traditional indexes are, are focused a lot on rates and equities and they don't necessarily capture um, lending conditions. So we think that, though. So there are other measures which, which, if they're focused on, you know, bank lending conditions and things like that, they show some more tightening. The, the question for us, though, is how significant will that be and how, you know, what will be the extent of it and what will be, what will be the duration of it? And, and then, you know, once you have, once you know that, there's a fair amount of research about how that, how that with broad uncertainty bands, how that works its way into the economy over what period of time. And so, you know, so we're, we'll be looking to see the first part of that, like how, how serious is this and how does it look like it's going to be sustained? And if it is, you know, it, it could easily have a, a significant macroeconomic effect, and we would factor that into our, into our policy decisions. I mentioned with rate cuts, it's, rate cuts are not in our base case. There you have it. Rate cuts are not in our base case. She came back to the question again. It was off mic. You couldn't hear it really well, but she basically just was asking, so what about rate cuts? So what about when those rate cuts going to happen? Rate cuts are not in our base case. That means they're not looking at it right now. That is a very strong statement that what they're trying to do is really increase that unemployment, get that get 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 that that unemployment to four and a half as, as quickly as possible. They're going to allow the credit crunch on the business side to work its way through the markets and they're going to try to quell inflation and that rate cuts are not going to be happening. This is not going to happen. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that, that's all I have to say. Well, there you have it. In the almost 44 minute Fed prepared statements and press conference, you got a lot of information. We discussed a lot of it here on the show today. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of graphs and charts that are going to be illustrations that we're going to let uh, we'll, we'll put out here so you guys can access and take a look at them. Uh, but you know, really what this means for mortgage and real estate in the end is that it's going to, uh, it's going to leave the markets to their own devices for quite some time. Uh, we should not expect the Fed to come in with any sort of quantitative easing, which means adding money to the system, like I'd explained they were doing. Uh, that means that the mortgage rates are going to be purely a reflection of money coming into the mortgage-backed security market or going out of the mortgage-backed security, uh, mortgage security market. So the more money that is enticed and attracted into the market can help drive rates lower. <clears throat> and if there's less money in the system, rates are going to remain elevated. That's just the way that it is. So um, I really do think that we're going to still see some uh, prices stabilize as far as home prices are concerned here in San Diego. Um, there are going to be certain pockets that are going to have material impacts to the upside or downside, depending on where people are looking, what the kind of amenities the house has, the neighborhood, the type of house, that kind of thing. Uh, but when it comes to the money, the money side of things, mortgage rates are going to uh, really just be kind of like a sailboat in the wind. They're going to just move and ebb and flow with the direction of whatever the financial market's pulse is at the time. Uh, there is zero expectation that the Fed is going to come to the table with any sort of support. There uh, looks to be zero expectation that uh, the Fed is going to stop rolling off uh, the, their balance sheet. And that means for the foreseeable future, all the way through 2023, 2024, 2025. So what that means to us here <clears throat> is that your situation is going to determine your next steps. So we talk a lot about preparation here. We talk a lot about preparing for the, the, the future, projecting and predicting what you got to do, and then persevering through those things. So if you're in a situation right now where maybe you don't know what you should do, you don't know what else means to you, maybe you're retiring in 2024 or 2025 or even 2026, and you're trying to make the right choices now, what should you do with your home equity? You're trying to figure out, should you move now or sell your house or stay? You're trying to determine, well, do I get a home equity line of credit because I have a really low first? Or should I get a reverse mortgage because I'm at the age at which I would qualify for that? These are all questions we're starting to field here at the office. And so, you know, barring all these other issues going on macroeconomics wise, really when this what this comes down to is what does it matter to you? How does this impact you personally? 
And then how can we help you make the best choices when it relates to what mortgage and real estate needs to look like for you in the foreseeable future? So when you look at 2024, 2025, 2026 even, yes, I can't believe I'm saying that, but even into 2026, we need to start talking now about what you should be considering, what you should be preparing for, and maybe right now is not the right time to make certain decisions or certain moves, but maybe some of those moves need to be planned out in the future, maybe in 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, so that you can do the preparation stuff now in order to enact the outcome that you're hoping to have in the future. So uh, we appreciate you watching the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. I know it's a little bit of a, a, a deviation from what we normally do, but the reason we did that today is because this specific rate announcement and this specific press conference from the Fed uh, is going to uh, really set the tone and the pace for all the financial markets for the, the rest of 2023. This is kind of like the Super Bowl of Fed meetings right now because of it happening so closely to the SVB bank failure, them stepping in and doing what they did, everyone now digesting and dissecting what the heck happened, how it's happening. And then you see Jerome Powell's comments today. This one really, really matters. I know you hear me a lot talk about, oh, this really matters a lot. And this is a big deal this week. And this is a big deal this month. This is over and above everything else that's happened this year in 2023. This, this was the meeting. This was the commentary. These were the Q and A's that we needed to hear to know what's going on and how we should forecast what we think is going to happen through the rest of this year. So thank you so much for watching. If you have questions and you need help from either William, from Brian or myself, please be sure to reach out to us at the office. You can call, you can email us, you can direct message, you can leave a comment wherever you're watching or listening to this. Um, just let us know what it is, what situation you might need to have uh, some, some commentary on, or at least sit down with someone for a strategy session and figure out what you can do to win in mortgage and real estate. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's Mortgage Heroes Weekly Podcast, and we'll see you again next week.